morning. Did he actually have you chanting? He must have watched Silicon Valley on HBO. All right, well, it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce you, Andrew Wilson. Uh, we thought a little audiovisual would be nice. I mean, after all, God did invent LinkedIn, so there's no reason for me to read his resume to you. Uh, 14 years at EA, uh, that is clearly a veteran. Uh, been all over the country, east, west, et cetera. Uh, and really, uh, a guy who really cares about the consumer, which I think is super important and one of the things that we'll talk about today. Uh, one of the first things he did at, uh, at EA is uh, quite a bit of structural change, big emphasis on collaboration, big emphasis on people working across teams, across studios, uh, and even better, inside the studios. Um, this is him spending time with the, uh, with the team at EA. Um, a lot of people are noticing uh, that Andrew, as I mentioned, has really repeatedly said in the press, player comes first, let's be committed to the player. Uh, we're going to look forward to uh, talking about his vision and how he really feels about the players and, and why he believes that's a central uh, commitment for the future of, uh, of EA. Uh, we've got FIFA coming up, uh, as you know, and at the end of uh, uh, Andrew's remarks, we'll actually show you uh, one of the first screenings uh, of the new TV trailer that's uh, coming out. Uh, Andrew's also, uh, uh, as you will see in a minute, you know, I challenged him to a little bit of, of kind of martial arts or something, but I wanted sumo and he wanted his expertise jujitsu, um, and I couldn't convince him that we'd do a surfing competition either. So that is the chairman of, uh, the CEO of EA, surfing right towards you, and hopefully coming right out. Thank you. I can't even get up. Uh, great good morning. To see you. Got a nice big crowd. Everybody seems to be uh, in a good mood on this nice day. You're all missing 90 degrees in LA, 95 degrees in LA. So I was in place. Mexico last week. It was 99. Felt like 199. <laughs> Probably was with the humidity. Uh, so a full year, huh? Uh, almost. Yeah, just yeah, about 11 months. Uh, I think a week to go, and I'm a full year in. There you go. And I still have my job, which is a which I guess is an accomplishment in and of itself. It seems like today, regardless of the industry, that's an accomplishment. Uh, so tell, tell us what it's like a, a year later. Tell us kind of where you are and where you wanted to be at this one year point. Uh, I, I think there's, anytime you come into a job like this one, there's a lot of things that you think about and that you think are important that you want to get done right when you come in. Um, I really had three things I wanted to get done um, or that we as a, as a team thought that we should get done as I came into the role. The first one was really establish that player first culture back inside the company. I'd grown up in the company. I started in the studio system in Australia. I kind of went through the UK, spent a lot of time at our EAC studio, where a focus on the player and the people that were enjoying the entertainment that you make were kind of the most important person that you thought about every day. And I really wanted to get back to that for the company um, and, and really start to think about how do we build relationships with those players. You know, my belief is that in the future of our industry, in a world where there are more devices that play games, more people creating content to play on those devices, that the relationships that you have with players are going to be the deciding factor between success and failure. Your ability to actually reach those players and deliver them entertainment is really going to be based on that relationship that you have with them. So I wanted to really get back to that. Um, digital was a, was a second really large focus for us. Again, if you want to have a relationship with a player in this day and age, really the only way that you can do that is through digital means. You know, the, that, that channel, that conversation that you can have through digital means was really important to us, and I really wanted the company to accelerate in that. And then the third, one of the things that you saw on that slide was this understanding that no longer could we operate in silos as a company. It couldn't be development on one side and marketing on the other side or sales or, or finance or legal. We actually had to work together. In this day and age, every single person of the, the eight or 9,000 people in the company had to accept responsibility for building and maintaining and nurturing and growing and deepening those relationships with players. So on those three things, player first, you know, digital transformation and one team, I think we made a lot of progress. This is, you know, the thing I keep telling, uh, you know, everyone in our companies, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon, it's a long journey. It was a long journey to get to the point that we got to when I took on this role. It's going to be a long journey to drive that full transformation as a company. But, you know, by all accounts, I think people are noticing a change at Electronic Arts. I'd probably be remiss if I didn't follow up with what's roughly a long journey. 
Is that more of a three year, five year sort of? Uh, well, again, I mean, three years in, in this industry is like a full epoch, right? It's a full era. Any number of things can happen in a three-year period. So, you know, certainly I would never profess to know anything that's going to happen beyond three years, uh, or at least not with, with any kind of sense of certainty. But I do believe that, you know, over the next three years, we will have been able to solidify EA as a player-first company. I do believe we will almost you know, be entirely a digital company. And I do believe that as a company, we will truly understand how to operate as an atomic unit where every single person in the company understands it is their responsibility to, to build, nurture, maintain, grow, and deepen relationships with our players and deliver the things that our players want. Let's talk a little bit about what I know are two important qualities of a player first, uh, two important aspects. Uh, one's quality and one's value. And let's take them separately, if you don't mind, since quality yep. is such a big deal for, for you, for your company, for the players, for the investors. Yep. Talk to us about quality in general, both in the console and the non-console world. Uh, you know, quality is it, it's a weird thing, right? So what we do is we create fun. As, as game makers, we create fun. And fun in and of itself is a, is a subjective measure. It's this emotional value calculation of enjoyment over time. And so anytime you start dealing with humans who are inherently random, emotions, which you know are emotions, they need no further explanation, and time and, and the change that happens that, you understand that things can become very complex to deliver what is fun in this world in this day and age where people have so much access to content and entertainment on a moment to moment basis. As we break it down, we think about it really in, in two vectors. The first is innovation. Um, doing something completely new or doing something old in a completely new way. And as we sit down with product reviews and uh, you know, product brainstorms, that's the first question we ask is what is the innovation? What are you doing that's completely new or what are you doing in a completely new way and how do we think that's going to translate into fun? The second thing for us is about polish. It's the absence of defects, the absence of things that would otherwise detract from that experience. I think what you see when you look at, you know, if you look at Metacritic or you look at review scores, the games that review highest, both at a critic level and at a consumer level, are the games that get that balance right. They give you amazingly new things to do, and they do it in a world where there aren't flaws or bugs that disconnect you from the experience or, or shatter that suspension of disbelief. And for us, that's what quality comes down to, and we challenge our teams on that. Um, every single day. When you, when you look at you know, something like Battlefield Hardline, which we moved, uh, we, we moved it because we thought there was more innovation that could go into the game. The core premise was really cool. We let people play. They said, yeah, we like this. This whole you know, cops and criminals thing is cool, but we think there's more innovation. We think you could be doing things more differently, or we, we think you'd be doing completely different things, and so we set that in motion. You know, when we moved Dragon Age just a few weeks, we did that because we thought we needed more time to get rid of the bugs. So the two decisions that we've made in the last few months, one around driving innovation, one around driving polish, both with the ultimate goal of quality. Um, we talked about value, and I've talked about it privately. You were yeah. quoted in the New York Times talking about it. Um, I know you want to give more to the, to the gamers. You want to give more to the players. Tell, tell us more about that how you think of value across the game, across games as a service. How much more value do you want to give them? Uh, you want to give as much value as you possibly can and still maintain a profitable business is, is kind of the, the, the magic formula. Um, you know, I've, I've told a story a few times. I won't bore the crowd with it again. You, you, you may have heard me talk about it before. Russell Simmons uh, you know, said to me once when I was very young, uh, who's a very smart man, by the way, he says, human beings have an inherent need to steal. And what he was really saying is human beings have an inherent need to, to get value. And when they give you $20 for something, they do so expecting that what you're going to give them is going to be worth more to them than that $20. Otherwise, they'd keep the $20 in their pocket. And I think that that's how we, we need to be thinking about games, whether it's with a premium business model or a subscription business model or a free-to-play business model. Every time someone gives you an amount of money, a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, whatever that might be, always get to a point where they feel like what they get in return is greater than what they put in. And if you can get to that, then what you do is you satisfy human beings' inherent need to steal on a daily basis. The reality is value is this kind of weird, amorphous subject. 
people spend $300,000 on a Ferrari and feel good about it, even though they can spend $30,000 and get a car that does exactly the same thing, or maybe better. I have a friend who spent $400,000 on a Ferrari. It's three months old. It's like, it's in the shop already. But, but for him, he still feels like that was a good purchase. And it's because what he got from that was worth more to him than the $400,000 he had in his pocket. I just wish I had $400,000 in my pocket to spend on a car. That, that, that you weren't driving. <laughs> that I'm not driving. But, oh. but value is important, and it really comes down to can you give someone something that they value more than the dollars or the time they invested to get it? All right, well, let's talk about $400 things, which is new consoles. Or I guess even at this point, I can't say new anymore. Current new next-gen yeah. uh, consoles. So um, uh, the data seems to be suggesting a, a great emerging second year. How do you kind of see the, the console uh, overall penetration and what that does for you in terms of tie ratios? And, and if you feel like it, maybe give us a little bit of your guesstimation on the year ahead between the two. Uh, big boys. Um, well, listen, I, th I think you know anyone in the room who kind of follows what's going on, you, we could be nothing but overjoyed with you know not just what the consoles are doing, but what the consoles are allowing players to do. What we see is not only uh, you know they selling faster than the last generation, which at a core financial level is you know great. Um, what they're doing is they're enabling a level of play for an amount of time and a level of connection and online and, and new ways to experience and fulfill those motivations that we have, escape, social connection, competition, creation, these reasons why we seek out entertainment, the new consoles are doing that better than just about anything else available to you in the entertainment landscape right now. And for us as an organization, that's really, really exciting. And when you start to look at games that you know, are in the marketplace and coming to the marketplace, there's been some amazing games already in this generation that you know, would only have been figments of our imagination as little as three or four years ago. And I look at things like Dragon Age Inquisitions coming out in you know, a month or so, and the size of that game. I look at our FIFA game coming, and I grew up making FIFA, and I thought FIFA that, that I worked on was awesome. And let me tell you, I mean, it's, it pales in comparison to what we can do on these new consoles as we're starting to unlock the power of what they can deliver. And, you know, for both Sony and Microsoft, I think they should be super excited about what they've delivered. I think for us as game makers, we are very excited about what we can deliver, and I think that people are going to continue to play as long as we can deliver that cool, innovative, fun content. Seems like you're going into Christmas and then heading into E3 with a lot of momentum. I think we'll see a price increase. You might already know, in which case you're no comment. No comment. There we go. We learned about that. At least it's easier to say no comment <laughs> after, the, after the machines have launched, that's for sure. Yes. Uh, so what kind of innovation should we see? Obviously a lot more realism. I mean, I'm not sure how much more real we can get. Uh, but what other sort of innovations do you think we see as a result of the next gen in the next year or two? Including, by the way, the, uh, the various uh, accessories uh, uh, existing and rumored. Um, it I think that immersion, you know, when you, when you look at the, the motivations for why people play, you know, escape is one of those big uh, front and center motivations that we have. You escape our daily grind and kind of immerse. And I grew up in a world where, you know, I saw the first Total Recall with, uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Anyone see the first one? Anyone see the second one? <laughs> yeah, the first one was better. The second one wasn't bad, but the first one was better. Um, but I think immersion is going to be you know, the real delivery for this, for this platform generation. You know, on the PS2 generation, that was the first generation that we, we got characters to start to kind of look like, you know, they did in, in real life, and you had to use less of your imagination. The PS3, Xbox 360 generation was really the first generation where we got characters to start moving like, like real human beings. As I look at this generation and I start to look at, you know, just the the CPU, GPU memory that we have available to us, I think we can start to create characters that emote more like their, their real world counterparts. And you combine that with the various peripherals that are, you know, that are in play right now, I think immersion is, is really the next step. And that ability to truly escape and, and have to use less of your imagination to fill in the gaps uh, of what the game experience is and really just kind of release yourself into the entertainment experience. I think that's the future for us. And certainly as we think about that, believable characters and immersive storylines, and you start to think about movies um, that you might have seen. Any, anyone see Snowpiercer? It's like a 90 rated movie. Um, it, I watched that film and I thought, wow, this as a film, this would be an awesome video game. 
And I think that we're going to start to see much more believable characters and much more immersive storylines in the, in the games that we make, even in sports games, um, by virtue of what these boxes can deliver. And I think you start to see things that would traditionally only have manifested themselves in film start to manifest in interactive, which is a far more powerful medium to tell a story. So how much of this is augmented reality? And then I'm going to ask how much of this is virtual reality. Um, I, I think the first, the first piece is really just getting to the nuts and bolts of what is an immersive world, you know, a believable physical world that reacts like you would expect it to react, um, believable characters that emote like you would expect them to emote, and then how you interact with them. I think they're, they're the, the kind of the three core components. As you start to move into augmented and virtual reality, I think they're all multipliers on that, but you have to be very careful as you kind of start to bridge that uncanny valley. And this is something that film has dealt with you know, for 20, 30 years as, they, as, as we move through animation, is that uncanny valley. As things start to become more and more believable, they become creepy. And for us, I think how we bridge that gap is going to uh, you know, really tell a lot about how creative our industry is. And I think we are better positioned by virtue of where we've come from to do that better than the film industry has. Is that generally how you feel about VR too then? Or, uh, or do you think that has... Um some distinctiveness that's not over real or creepy? Uh, VR, again, what people don't know f about me for the most part um, is before I worked in video games, I worked in the internet world. And at the time, I was part of a company that was the biggest user of iPix photography, which was this virtual reality photography. We built a series of websites uh, that were virtual reality travel sites and sports sites. and So I've always had this belief that the ability to put a human being inside an experience that they otherwise couldn't get into is a very profound experience for someone. Um, going back to Total Recall. Um, I, I truly believe that if you think about the modalities of play today, the, the lean back experience, I'm sitting in my living room, I'm looking at a 16-inch screen. The lean in experience, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a laptop or a computer. And the lean over, I'm looking at a mobile device as a three core modalities. That kind of get in, that immersive experience, I think is going to be one that we as an industry are going to be challenged to deliver. I think people really you know, are inspired by that notion of, wow, I can actually get into something and experience something that I would not otherwise be able to do. And I think our industry, again, is better placed to do that than any other industry is. Now, does that happen as a result of goggles? Or does that happen as a result of a pod you get into? Or does that happen as a result of a hologram that comes up through your living room floor? Again, look for movies as our inspiration. Um, there is any number of um, peripherals or you know, technologies that might deliver it. That I'm not sure about right now. What I can tell you is we've got a series of uh, incubation labs going on across the company right now, looking at various different ways to deliver that get in, that immersive experience, because we believe that at some point it's our responsibility as an industry and as a, as a leading company in the industry to start to deliver a new modality of play. You talk about innovation, actually giving someone a fundamentally different way to play could be very, very profound. But, you know, it's early days. You know, I've heard some people in our research say they play the game better with VR. Now, if that's true, that's a killer app. Yeah. Anything that helps you play the game better is a killer app. Exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit about mobile. Um, would love to hear just in general about the, the mobile uh, initiatives and where you see them changing over the next year or two. And would love to have you talk a little bit about smartphone and tablet as, as different types of devices. Um, Mobile for us is an important part of you know, the future. Again, when, when we look at mobile and you look at other forms of media, whether it's music or TV or movies, what you come to understand is that mobile hasn't replaced traditional ways of viewing or enjoying media. It's kind of augmented and enhanced those things and gives you a way to do that at times of the day that you otherwise couldn't experience entertainment. I, you know, I think about a world in the future where uh, by virtue of the ongoing evolution of technology, much the way in music. So in digital music today, pretty much every device I have has the capacity to play me music. How I want it, when I want it, the way I want it. Um, I see a world in the future where uh, the ongoing evolution of devices will mean that interactive entertainment will permeate your lives much the way digital music does today. So as we think about strategy for our company, we think about a world where you are going to have an interactive experience that permeates your life from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night, Mobile is a really, really important part of that. 
For many people, that will be the only way they experience games. For, for a lot of people, that will be an augmentation to a much bigger experience that they enjoy. And as a result of that, we're investing heavily in mobile. And we're really looking at it you know, in terms of you know, what can you do with the screen size. Again, you can't just take a bunch of console games and, and push them into mobile. That doesn't work. We've tried it. Other people have tried it. It, it doesn't work that way. And you've also got to think about session time. So if you, if you think about those two vectors, screen size and session time, and the, and the other things that come off that, control and you know, power and bandwidth, but you start to create different experiences that can help you enjoy interactive entertainment throughout your day. Um, and as we look to the future, we think that could be a really meaningful part of our company's business. And we're investing on that basis. Do I think it replaces the other modalities of play? No, I don't. No more than I've stopped watching my 60-inch television at home. Um, but do I think it will mean that people gain more on the whole? Yeah, I do. And it is meaning that. I mean, we're seeing that already. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not any smarter than anyone in this room who can look at how much people are playing games today by virtue of the addition of mobile in their gaming world to know that you know, that's going to be a meaningful part of the future. Um, as we think about you know, mobile versus tablet, you know, that's a really interesting thing. Uh, note the proper use of the word mobile to mean a phone. Yes. Thank you. We're going to try to teach everybody the English use of the word mobile to mean phone and tablet to mean tablet. There is no such thing as, if you want a word like that, use touch devices. Talk to us about phones. OK. Um, I wasn't meaning to be that profound, but I'm glad I was. <laughs> Um, so as, as we think about it, again, I, I think that what you're going to see, and you're starting to see this now, is there will be an evolution of experience. If you think about screen size and session time as the two vectors that drive the type of experience you have, then a tablet has the potential to deliver you a different experience than the phone does. And, and you have the ability to do things differently. And if you look at some of what the Asian companies have done over the years, companies like, like Nexon, uh, who are an amazing company. We have a partnership with them on our FIFA product in, in Korea. Many years ago in Asia, there was kind of casual web games that were kind of too many experiences. And there were these hardcore MMO RPG type games, which were six, seven, eight, 10, 24 hour experiences. And you know, companies like Nexon stood up and said, wow, we think there's this magic time frame, this kind of 15, 20, 25 minute session time, this mid session time that really gives you a greater level of immersion and engagement than these two minute web games do, but don't require the level of commitment that these big MMORPGs do because not everyone has six hours at a time to play. And, and this whole new segment of gaming was born. And that is now effectively the majority of the Asian PC online game market. When I look at tablets, I think tablets are probably the single best device to deliver that type of game on a global basis. And again, as we think about our strategic future, that's how we think about tablet. Today, the majority of the revenue comes from mobile phones. It just does. Um, and mobile phone game experiences, even those that are played on tablet. But I do believe that there is an evolution coming that will allow us, like Nexon did and Tencent did in China many, many years ago, to actually create this new genre of game that is mobile in orientation, but played for, for a longer period of time than the two minute sessions you do today, um, but without the kind of commitment that you need to sit down in front of your television, in front of a 60 inch screen and boot up something. Is that classified as the uh, frequently discussed AAA tablet game? Um, I think that's a different conversation. Again, when you look at what you know, Nexon and Tencent did, those games were not necessarily in the early days AAA by our definition. Um, I wouldn't be so bold as to overlay a, a definition that I have today of what AAA means into the tablet space. I think that will evolve in and of itself. And players will tell us what AAA means to them. That might be graphics. Um, that might be controls. That might be storyline. That might be characters. That might be genre. It might be any number of things. I think the important thing to understand is what you're trying to do is entertain a player in 15, 20, 25 minute sessions, and we're going to have to build experiences that do that effectively. All those things may play a part, but when it comes down to what you have to think about is, what, how do we fulfill the player's motivation for entertainment at that point in time? 
We have these motivations, inspiration, escape, social connection, competition, creation, self-improvement. These are why we seek out entertainment. These are why we play games. On a mobile phone, the companies that are doing well are the people that can deliver that to you in two-minute sessions. EA was built and the ability to deliver that to you on a 60-inch screen in two-hour sessions. We're learning the two-minute session part. Um, there will be a world where you deliver that in 20-minute sessions, and it's different from the two minutes, and it's different from the two hours. So we are going to have time to show the trailer, but before we do that, the new FIFA trailer, before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about EA access and new business models and, and how subscriptions fit in and, and just kind of give us a sense of how you're trying to build this portfolio of business models. Um, again, I as a... As a company, you can never you know, fall foul of believing that one business model is going to rule them all. You, ju you just can't. And free-to-play right now is an ever-evolving and emerging business model. It's been in play you know, for 10 or 15 years in Asia. Um, it hasn't eliminated all other business models. There are still other business models for you know, engaging in entertainment that exist. We believe that there is a future where there are more players playing more games across more devices. And in a world that is that broad and that abstract, we have to start thinking about the different ways that people are going to want to engage with entertainment. And as we look around, and as I think about even myself as a survey of one, I have a Comcast subscription. I buy extra things, UFC events and movie rentals on top of that Comcast subscription. I have Netflix. I download things through iTunes, because I spend a lot of time on a plane, I watch it on my iPad, and then I watch a bunch of surfing events that are ad-driven on YouTube through ASPWorldTour.com in combination with YouTube. So, the, I mean, even I as an individual consume media through multiple different business models, and as we looked at what we were doing, we weren't providing the value model that subscription offers to a broad level of content like Netflix does, and so that's what eAccess is. It's really about saying, hey, we think there is a player that wants to engage in these types of games, in this type of environment, in this context, for a, for a value exchange that makes sense for them, and that's EA Access, and it's, it's been going really, really well so far. Will it eliminate everything else? No, I don't think so, but I think it's targeted at a great uh, subset of our player base who really wants to engage that way. Yes, people do move quickly. Uh, we moved, uh, there's still plenty of premium games out there. A lot less than there used to be, but they're far from dead. But they're playing them more than they ever did. Is that true? Absolutely. I mean, we look at, we, I mean, you look at a game like FIFA, we get record online play day six, seven months post-launch. I mean, we've changed the model. As an industry, you know, we woke up one morning and, and we still sell a game, but what we deliver to the player for six, eight, 10, 12 months after that, in many cases for free, um, it's pretty profound, and we're delivering new content into games like FIFA every week, and that's why they're playing them longer. So there may be less on retail shelves than there was before, but gamers are still coming in and buying them en masse, and they're playing them more than they ever did, and they're connecting with their friends in a greater way through competition and social connection than they ever have done before. So for me, I look at our industry, and you know, we're exactly where we need to be. All right, well, let's see uh, your, your upcoming game. Tell us a, a word or two about this FIFA trailer we're about to see. So, so FIFA coming up, um, one of our big games of the year, very dear, near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, we've really tried to change how we think about our campaigns this year. I think it's a cool piece. I think it's an Academy Award winning performance by Goldfish. Um, and that's all I'll say. I love Goldfish. Let's yeah. see the trailer. Welcome to a beautiful evening in Barcelona. Liverpool has got a party to go, crushing. This is the game we've been waiting for. You can feel the tension in the air. It's game on at the new Camp. Manchester City showing no signs of nerves. Sergio Aguero. Oh, what a save. Chelsea can come away here. For Dortmund, pass one, pass two. Well, let's see that again. Yeah, it doesn't get any prettier. Chelsea's got a free kick now, in a dangerous position. Real 
rope around Stamford Bridge. Eden Hazard. Surge forward. That's playback. Referee says play on, and Messi certainly wants to do that. Challenged by Aguero, he's brushed him off. And beat another challenge. EA Sports. It's in the game. Ultimate Team Legends, only on Xbox.